but um, from Dr. Alan Thompson. And he said this on the Financial Sense uh, interview where he was talking about AI and GBT4. And the question was, you know, w about what, what would you compare um, the AI revolution with from past revolutions in history or something like that. So this is what, this is the soundbite right here. I've heard some of my colleagues say that there's never been a revolution, that there's never been like the agrarian agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, even the information revolution, they wouldn't be a blip on this chart that AI is such a huge change for humanity that nothing else has even registered and I think that's very true. I don't think there's anything we can compare this to. You've had uh, Google compare this to electricity and fire and the internet. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates within the last few days is comparing it to the microprocessor and the mobile phone. I think it's even more extraordinary than that. I, I struggle to come up with words for it, but certainly it is more profound than the discovery of fire. This is like harnessing everything that humanity has been able to achieve and then exponentially multiplying that and making it available to everyone. Mm, wow. That just puts it into perspective for me. <laughs> so with that said, mm -hmm. if this whole AI thing is going to go ahead and we are indeed <laughs> at the foot of a, the biggest revolution that humanity has ever seen bigger than fire bigger than the industrial revolution bigger than agri agriculture bigger than tv bigger than compact disc bigger than iphone yeah well it's the samsung use iphone wasn't that impressive but all right maybe not bigger than <laughs> iphone but no, you know it's, it's up there it was pretty good it was pretty good it, it, it did revolutionize um the way we looked at phones and and started the revolution of uh, re revolution of the bigger screens right all right uh, everything's going smaller so it's a phone it's an internet communicator mm -hmm. and it's a breakthrough oh i can't remember what steve Jobs said but yeah those three things he's reinvented the phone Rubber banding, all this. Oh, I just remember the keynote. It was amazing. He, he reinvented how we interface with the phone, right? Uh, for me, that was the key yeah. change. The yeah. way humans interfaced with the phone and then it just went from there. So now let's say that this, this is happening. This is, this is going to happen. So Jobs. Not Steve how, Jobs, just Jobs in general. Yeah. yeah. Not Steve Jobs. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He took our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it is. The AI is, he took our jobs. Yeah, well, how do you get angry at a, an AI? <laughs> you took you... my job. Where do you live? <laughs> oh, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And this is the third time. Third time now. So, yeah. internet revolution, uh, not internet, AI revolution's coming. What are we going to do? How are we going to integrate this thing into our jobs? I have an idea. What's you were you were talking about it before, with the medical professionals, and how you have an AI assistant. So, first thing, this is in my my little world theory thing, whatever. And you can poke holes in it, please. Steel man it. <laughs> steel, steel man, man the yes. heck out of it, right? Please steel man it. All right, because I only come up with it, and I think, oh, shiny new theory, Roy, and someone has to come along and just go. I'll ah. listen to you with intent, with empathy, and I'll determine, and I'll repeat what I think I've heard. Then you'll blow it out of the water. Yes, I know. Okay. So the first thing I think should happen is the government puts a freeze. No one loses their job to AI. It is uh, an offense to take someone's job with an AI. That's just to get the ball rolling. That's phase zero or whatever it is. Just, just so that people stop freaking out. Okay. Then phase one, everyone that is in a profession gets a license code 
ABN number, whatever you want to call it. It's just this license to keep doing what they're doing. Okay, so dentists get a dentist license, doctors get a doctor's license, mechanic gets a mechanic license, painter Couriers gets a, get a courier yeah. license. You've got the whole span of human endeavors got licenses. And these licenses are only allowed to be possessed by humans. Yep. In their respective fields or whatever. Qualifications matter. Your university, your TAFE, whatever it was, your pedigrees, it matters. People are happy. It's safe. On the other end, you've got the AI startups, the LLMs. They want to approach that space and contribute. So how do you have your cake and eat it too? So what you could do is you could have, as you said earlier, the AIs assist the doctor, all right? They're not facing the patient, they're facing the doctor. The doctor interrogates the AI, the AI advises the doctor, the doctor makes the final decision and the patient is seeing the doctor not the AI, right? So the AIs help, they assist the professionals in whatever profession. That increases efficiency, makes people more productive. The economy just takes off. And who gets it? The humans. The humans reap the, the rewards at this stage, okay? So what, what do we have here? We have the AIs being trained by the professionals in the professions that they want to help. So you have human oversight, you have professional oversight, and you have insulation against the law because the law is, you know, let's say with a medical prof professional, it's the doctor's final responsibility. It, it doesn't go to the AI. The AI can make a mistake. It can spout you know, potentially gibberish that doesn't make sense apparently, right? Depending on the training. So with the training, as the training improves and the AIs get more accurate, the startup companies reap the rewards of getting vastly better AIs, right? But then they still have to go through the humans who have the licenses. They contribute to those businesses and those professions. Those professions reap the benefits economically Okay, so the income stream still goes to the humans, but with the assistance of the AIs. Okay. And let's take a real simple example. Like a, a, let's say it's not a very technical job. Let's say it's a lower skill job. Let's say it's a cleaning company, a bunch of cleaners. Yep. Right. The license would still apply. So an AI company would come in. Yes, we would like to uh, work under your license for cleaning. And the cleaners go, okay, yep. So they might have robotics or something, whatever it is by this stage, this is probably further down the track. The cleaners train the robots, the robots go off and clean. It's still the human's clients. So it's, it's still XYZ company cleaning for XYZ, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G clients. So the, the, it's all still human to human uh, business relationships, but just the AIs are underneath. And that way, the humans get grandfathered in to a supporting role. The income stream still flows through the same avenues. They get bolstered because there's more efficiency, more ability to work. The AI companies, they get personal, uh, professional oversight from professional cleaners in real life situations to augment and uh, train their uh, AIs. So that, that tran that's the transitionary phase I think would really work well. All right, so you're, you're essentially preventing human job loss. Yes. Getting humans comfortable with meaning, so still giving them a job, as opposed to them just getting a universal basic in income and staying at home, mm. um, which would obviously help, you know, because of psychological factors associated with people having meaning in life, et cetera, et cetera, and people derive meaning from work. We'll come back to that. Yes, but yes. And at the same time, you're allowing businesses to be able to get the benefit from a cost reduction, uh, improved efficiencies, et cetera. The, and so uh, I'm, that is, that's the basics. That's what I'm understanding, yeah? 
Yeah. And I'm waiting for the holes to be poked in because it's no good to have a theory like this if, you know, it doesn't work. You need to poke as many holes as possible into it. And uh, I won't be happy with, like, I, I assume it's riddled with um, uh, uh, faults and, and, you know, short-sightedness and whatever else. No, I mean, I can see that obviously there's bureaucracy I, here yeah, yeah, where yeah. you have to, you know, develop a, a way to yeah, it's got a, it's, it's a little long way to go, yes. New licenses have to be created when there's job applicants, you know, companies growing and they want to be able to grow the number of humans in their business so they have to apply for more human licenses, the human licenses. They still might only have one AI working in the company, well, they one license. Hmm. So I, I get the concept. I'm just trying to think. And for a short time, I think it, it's a potential solution. But then I think about a longer period of time where macroeconomics comes into play, where we've got the aging population issue, where there's going to be less humans essentially doing work. There's going to be a natural tendency for, um, or, or the, the jobs become undesirable, right? There's yes, a natural yes, te yes. tendency for people to go, well, hang on a minute, I don't want to be a cleaner now. I have That's the right. ability, I, I can have free education. I can educate myself to become a computer programmer to develop more AIs. Um, I'm going to leave this cleaning profession and all of a sudden there's five licenses and only one human that wants to be a cleaner at, the, at this point in time. Which um, makes their position more and more valuable because of scarcity. True. So then more companies would have to go under that person and that person's status. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it could be a whole thing. <laughs> I think the biggest issue you have is how you'd market a license. I get the sense that, you know, if there was anything that needed to be governed by a license in order to prevent harm, you would hope, uh, you know, we have a license for driving a car, right? Well, Clearly I mean, that's a dangerous thing that can happen. Therefore, we need training, et cetera. I, I would look at it not, not necessarily like a driver's license, which could be acquired. This is kind of like... Uh, just a number. It is like... Like a tax file number. Like a taxi, taxi license plate. You notice how with taxi number plates, you have to, in order to drive a taxi or to operate a taxi business in, in, in Australia at least, you have to have a taxi number plate and they sell for like over a hundred thousand dollars. Well, they used to. I well, they used to. Yeah. They came down because of Uber. Ah, well, there you go. But you see that <laughs> that's, a, that's very Once good. Once again, technology and, technology and, just and disruption in the market, right? Uber. Usurps everything. Yeah. So well, you didn't need a license and it could be a, Joe Blow uh, yeah. or Jane Smith driving around in a vehicle, not need a taxi license. Yes. So this shows, this just shows two things. So first in the previous economy, when say we didn't have a competitor like Uber, a taxi license, it, it kind of self-regulated. So there'd be a certain number of licenses. People would buy and sell these licenses to get in and out of the business, yeah. et cetera. And retirement funds for some people. Yeah. And also, I mean, you've got, um, well, I mean, that's just, think, yeah, it's, it's a basic licensing model. So you would, um, and, and I wanted to come back to your question about UBI. Yes, UBI, the problem with UBI is if you just suddenly launch a blanket UBI, people will look at their skills and go, I don't need this anymore. I'm not going to, what, what's the point in me continuing this skill if I'm just going to get paid money? So the bricklayers will forget how to lay bricks or will just become less and less competent the longer it takes for, say, uh, an AI startup to get into that particular sector, right? So uh, you have a you have a gap where people you want people to maintain their skill set, but if you're dishing out UBI, they they're, they're going to go. Well, what's the point of maintaining this skill set for what? Whereas if you say, look. AIs are coming into your industry and people will wonder, oh, I wonder if they're going to get to my industry next. Oh, they're developing robotics. Maybe they'll get into the building and bricklaying industry. Yes, they're coming in. I hope that they sponsor my uh, construction company so that I can get AI workers. It might become a boon, like something that people just wait for. They're like, oh, my industry's next. Can't wait for the AI startups to give me a Can't a wait to be around. able to go to the beach and surf every day. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll see their friends in other industries and the AI comes in and they'll be like making 10 times as much money and people will be like, when, when, when's my industry going to 
come up, oh, well, they haven't made the robotics or whatever to service your industry yet. Just wait, just hang in there. So what do they do when they're hanging in there? They keep their skill set up. They keep everything running as smoothly as they can and as best they can so that when the AIs develop whatever technology it is to get into their industry, they present their business as the best that uh, can be most suitable for AI training. And there you go. And so the skills, the human skills get transferred over to the AIs and they love every step, every step of the way. I think the fundamental problem I would have, not saying it is an issue for everyone, but it's the transitioning, right? If you're, if you're in the industry that just has to wait for the development of a sufficient robotics in order to be replaced by the AI and you're looking over the fence and he's like, what well, that guy sitting in the hammock every day, seven the lattes and I have to go out to work and work my butt off. I'm not necessarily happy about that. Um, I think the other potential problem mm. there is that that's a, a transitioning issue, right? Yeah. You've got this whole problem where you're going to get different sectors of the economy that's going to be affected by this much faster than other parts of the economy. But say, for example, we hit it all at once, like we could turn it on and everyone's replaced overnight. I, we can't do that. I know. I'm just because, saying, but, but, but the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, t I'm extrapolating. Okay. Even over 10 years, right? Okay. Businesses have to be run. So what's going on? Uh, I'm trying to think of the economy, economics around this, right? Okay. So all my employees are now being fundamentally replaced by, you know, if, if they're in the service industry by an AI, if it's in a goods capacity, maybe a reduction in the labor force, but eventually by robotics and AI. Yep. Remember, they have a license. Yeah, yeah, I get so, it. So whenever that robot makes something, it has to go through their pay. No, 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 I don't have an issue with that. Yeah. But I'm going, okay, so who's running the company now? Ah, uh, well, I guess the same people. Uh, is an AI replacing the CEO? Um, it could, okay. as long as it uses the CEO's license. <laughs> so the AI is generating $1.2 million for the CEO, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just as smart as the CEO now, technically, because my AI is just as smart as the CEO's AI. I see what you're getting at. So you're yeah. saying that eventually, because everyone could almost, because all the AIs can do almost everyone else's jobs, it starts to become, you know, why am I here and that person's there and all this, that, the other. It gets really messy is what I'm trying to say. Like I, I'm having, I'm a human, right? Maybe if I was artificial, I could think about this in, in computation smarter and faster than I currently am. But I'm just extrapolating even further. Like, okay, competition. What happens with competition? What happens with the, you know, there's, yeah. You can see where I'm trying to. Yes. So there's some things that I'm hoping will happen during this transition. And I, I don't have the solution. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm hoping that something is m magically managing this or, or people, you know, figure this out. So the skills, people will be realizing what skills are um, in demand and the, through the schooling system, that's the types of people that will be birthed into the workforce in the future. So, you know, as you said, who wants to be a cleaner? So those jobs will be going down. The number of no licenses. No disrespect to cleaners, by the way. They're, they're a valuable part of um, yeah, yeah, every yeah. workforce and all that sort of stuff. But I, I get it. They're not as desired. What we mean by this is they're not as desirable as other professions. Mm. Yeah, so the cleaners' licenses will dwindle and so they'll have to kind of conglomerate under fewer and fewer cleaners. Same thing's happening with ASP developers, by the way. ASP is a very old language. Oh, yeah, and talking about this yeah, the other day. And the f there's, few, there's very few ASP developers and they charge so much money because there's only a few of them. Yeah, and I think it's, and yeah, it's kind of like probably possibly those economic forces will have a same, the same effect, you know, as the cleaners, uh, profession goes down, like the ASP developer profession goes down, you won't have anybody learning ASP, but the people that know ASP, they get so much work to maintain the exist. There's over 1.5 million ASP sites still running, by the way. Until, so, uh, artificial intelligence is being utilized to be able to make those changes with ASP code. 
Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. It is so hard to like keep all of this in my mind to like <laughs> work stuff out. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, getting back to the simplified thing I was talking about. So yeah, so I kind of like the idea. A license. License is generating income. Mm. I get more time. I just wish we could be able to figure out I guess if it is an exponential growth, right? And that's what we're predicting, that the implementation of AI and solutions yep. that they're creating is exp exponential. Uh, if that holds true, then most people won't be waiting for long. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So the the key is at least in the, in the short to midterm future, you have two things. One, human jobs are preserved. Two, AIs can't make money the AI machines can't make money directly. They have to make money under a human license and the money stream goes through the human. And that way you're protecting, you're grandfathering that entire generation of workers. Um, you know, and then the new generation, they'll obviously go, well, I'm not going to go into X, Y, Z field. I'm going to go into this other field. Or by then the prospect of jobs will be more, what do you want to do? Maybe maybe we'll even be talking about colonization, right? Yeah. Which planet do you want to visit? I want to go to Titan and just fly around. <laughs> well, now you can without leaving your armchair, thanks to Meta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the 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 whole I don't know what to call it the whole. I mean, this is getting a bit too deep for workforce <laughs> thing, but you know, I mean, the whole prospect of you know what do you do during the day is going to be so different people you know we've we've had three meals a day for hundreds of years because we've had people working in the fields and so we've had breakfast Bunches lunch and dinner yeah you know, that whole paradigm might change again you know before we had electricity um i think i i saw a doco that um a human being slept twice. We would sleep in the beginning and we'd actually wake up halfway through the night and go partying for a bit and then go back to sleep. We don't do that, that anymore. That still happens in Spain. Oh, does it? <laughs> I'm talking about a Ibiza. <laughs> <laughs> so, there, there, I mean, there, there's just, we don't have to be doing what we're doing because we've only been doing what we've been doing very recently. I mean, the, the, you know, we've done things differently in the past and I'm sure that we'll do things differently in the future, but it's the transition, the transition that matters because it's the delicate nature of our world economy and local economies that's going to suffer greatly if we don't get the balance right. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, and this is an interesting point that I would like to explore a little bit further, right? So last week I was talking to you about the fact that the world economy is essentially, um, you know, we're at a point now where we really need to start talking about the macroeconomic uh, side of things. And, and what I mean by that is I've been listening to uh, a few podcasts. I uh, just want to, I'm picking up my laptop because I don't want to get this wrong, right? I don't want people going, hey, you got it wrong, <laughs> you idiot. I think um, you're talking about the, the gaping hole in the US economy, like, 40 trillion or 80 trillion. I can't remember what it was. Yeah. Bitcoin yeah. Pretty and much. crypto, China tanking it and, um, the Ru Russia and Ukraine war issues, Europe's energy crisis. I mean, where, where would you want to start? <laughs> yep. They're all valid points and they're all part of the starting point. Right. So we, you know, if you want to look it up, the, the guy's name is Rob Paul. I think he's, uh, runs a company called, um, real vision. Um, he essentially was talking about this in, in greater context. So he does a lot of research and obviously he's, um, part of the finance industry and I was listening to what he was saying with intent. Oh, this guy. Yes. So yes, what, yes. what he was basically saying is that since 2009, right? So he's done the research. And I'm happy if, you know, if I'm wrong, he's wrong, but he's done the research and he said basically since the recession, right? Yes. That essentially GDP growth in the United States has been just enough to cover off the interest payments, 
right? Since 2009. So what does that mean in layman's terms? So essentially I've got a credit card. I've maxed it out. Yes. I'm paying out that 2%. I'm getting a credit card to pay off that 2%. All right. So for mathematical sense, listen to this, right? So this is what he was talking about. So I'm mm. going to sort of try and do it justice. So the US has say an average, I think it's 1.8 three or something, like that, but let's, let's keep it simple, like 2% long-term growth rate averaged out. Right. Um, and let's say it's interest payments is averaged out around about 2%. Right. So the government is a hundred percent in GDP debt. Jeez. Right. And it's not the only government. Right. So, but I'm just using the United States as an example. So the interest payments is basically 2% of the entire GDP. Right. <laughs> which is exactly how much the economy is growing on average, right? Assuming it doesn't go backwards, right? So let's just assume it's staying at that 2%. And then we go across into the private sector mm -hmm. and they're also at 100% GDP uh, in debt, all right? But they're the ones that are generating the, GPT, uh, the GDP, right? So where is that extra 2% to cover off their interest coming from essentially it goes into the feds balance book they print money correct they call it targeted quantitative easing, easing. and why do they call it quantitative targeted uh, targeted quantitative easing easy yeah because it sounds nice because it sounds nice it sounds like it's done with purpose right and why are they doing it that way because if you <laughs> if you really scrape away you're devalua devaluing the currency. And it's the federal, it's a world reserve currency. Right. So. And they got the nukes. They've got the to nukes. bat around the bush, but who's going to, he's going to force them to pay if they, you know. <clears throat> well, they, they, they do. So that's the United States, right? Japan is no different. And they're a massive economy. So they, they you've really got two huge economies. They crashed. So they, what, 20 years ago? They did. And they ate into the, the supers, I think, of all the Japanese citizens. Was they, that right? Yeah, <coughs> uh, their, their economy was five trillion. I vaguely remember that they're seizing, um, yeah, it was basically five, your money. Yeah, it was five trillion like 20 years ago. And it's still, it, it stayed the same for like decades stagnated because you know they they were just hanging on from from the previous uh recession or something like that that they, they, they yeah and they 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 had their own strategy in order to get their economy up and running but their economy doesn't grow as much as the united states so i think they're much less in their growth i could be wrong guys that are listening to this podcast that are uh you know their background is finance they'll probably be able to correct me but essentially Yes, they're a different rate, but they're still in significant debt. Mm. Um, and you go into other countries in Europe and the same sort of thing. Why am I talking about this? Because, okay, we're talking about GDP, right? So what are we talking about GDP? It's people. So, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, yes. an indicator well, of econo the economy. Let's just, let's just break down. <coughs> sorry. Let's just break down that acronym. Gross domestic, domestic product. product. And what do AIs... What will AIs bring to the table? I don't know, bro. What would the AI more, bring to the table? I'm guessing more GD, gross domestic product. Yeah. Straight well, off the bat. Pretty much you, you've taken the thunder out. Thanks. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's a, so that's a, your way of saying, Pala, just cut to the chase. Okay. But, but I wanted to illustrate something. This is why I'm saying it's a fundamental thing why you can't stop the AI. That's my, that was my point. All these people are saying, you know, doom and gloom and yes, it is doom and gloom, but so is our economy. So is the global economy. It's a doom and gloom situation. They need to rescue it in some way, shape or form. You've got mm. people, you know, think about GDP. GDP is about people, number of people, right? More people, more immigration, more babies being born. Um, it, it contributes to GDP, right? You've got more people and they're being more productive, Yes. That contributes to GDP, right? And we already talked about the economy, right? So you've got those two things. Now, people are having less children, right? COVID saw a decrease in immigration, 
right? I, I can't say it's back to normal levels, but you saw, so not only are people having less, so you've got an aging population problem and you can see this across the world yes. in many different countries, especially those that are in significant debt. You've got this um, productivity issue, right? Because of the aging population again, right? So they're out of the workforce, right? And then you've got this more debt. Countries are just taking on more debt, more debt, more debt, which you see assets increase, right? House prices are increasing. Asset yes. values are increasing, right? And it makes sense. Take on more debt. Take on more debt because you will help, you know, your economy grow. And it makes sense until it doesn't anymore. So what does the AI do for us? The productivity gain, right? To get out of this mess, to get out of this GDP mess that we currently find ourselves in, countries have no choice. They have to start implementing this AI. Otherwise, what are they going to do? Well, if they don't and other countries do, they're left behind. Well, there's another option, right? But I think it's going to come in tandem, right? What's the other option? Well, the other option was wean ourselves off oil, right? So the cost of oil has been pretty static, right? It goes up and down, but essentially we know how much it costs per barrel. Right, and we we well, can't it, produce it, more oil. It it did do a few somersaults during COVID. It does, but in general terms, we know how much a drum of oil is costing us. Um, and in order to so GDP, right? Uh, you think about productivity. Productivity means certain output for a certain unit of energy. Right. So mm -hmm. yes. if I hold my right. output it's the same but I change my input of energy and reduce the cost of energy, bing, 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 what have governments been doing? They've been investing in sustainable energy, right? Sustainability is key. You see all these large companies talking about, we got to save the world, you know? The environment is in dire straits. We need to transition to renewables. What they're not the telling you is it's because of money, right? Yes. It's, yes, the world is in trouble and we humans want that climate change issue to be resolved. But essentially big organizations that are pumping money into this field, it's because the unit of cost of energy will go, will plummet Fantastic. significantly once you get sustainable energy. See, I was also just doing a few mm, desktop calculations here. So... The world population was apparently 7.8 billion in 2021. Wow. I'm going to round it up to 8 billion now, even though we haven't done a census. I'm just going to say, okay, let's say 8 billion. That's huge. Apparently, there were 109 billion people. Um, oop, My bad. 109 billion people that has lived and died. So... If you do 109 divided by 12, you get 9 billion. So let's say 109 divided by 13. So 13 to 14. Let's just pretend it's 12. So it's like if you roll the dice, two dice, um, and you got a 12, you're alive right now. And if you got any other number, you would have been alive at some other point during history. So it's like the people that are alive now, that's a significant amount of the total number of human beings that have been alive because our population now is so huge compared to what it was a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. Assuming the younger, driest period didn't wipe out all those civilizations, those ancient civilizations. Yeah. Well, I which mean, which could have had bigger populations. Oh yeah, that's right. We, <laughs> we didn't document it, but I mean, <laughs> sorry. Assuming, sorry. assuming yeah, that, I love those like shows. you know, based on uh, if we assume that they didn't have immense technology, and I'm talking they, about uh, uh, ancient apocalypse on uh, Netflix. By if anyone's wondering what the hell I'm going on about. <laughs> Okay, possibly if this, if if we just assume that didn't happen, okay, we didn't have ancient aliens in, yeah. out of astronauts and theories and all this, but if we had, say, way less than a billion people until just hundred years ago, less, 
and then all of a sudden we're at eight billion. Um, we we so so there's a lot of people alive now that um, compared to all humans that have ever lived. So yep. to be alive now, it it does seem like a huge. Uh, you know, we rolled the dice and we what million to one odds. It's not really million to one odds. It's it's like fourteen to one that we would be alive at this point in time. Because compared to all the humans that have ever lived, we are um, we are we are, you know eight billion versus a hundred nine billion. That's like thirteen fourteen to one odds. That you'd be live right now. Where was I going with this? I was I'm just saying that it's 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 ask. it's just it feels like it is the most amazing time in history. But also, it's like we've like our species have spanned, let's say, two hundred thousand years. Yep, the, the tip of our finger now. That analogy: if you hold your hands apart. And, yeah. Yep. So it's like to be born at this very very, you know, moment in history, out of all of the time period, that's still like, um, you know, rolling a 12 on a dice to, to be there because there's so many people squished into this area. Eight billion of us alive right now compared to only 109 billion stretched across 200,000 years. Yeah, I get it. That's what I mean. And, and... If I had a choice of when I was able to come on this earth, if there was such a thing, I would be choosing now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but, but not because I'm I'm here, but I'm just thinking about hum think about human history. Yeah. And I just think about our diet that's changed, you know. Oh yeah. I think it's Yuck. the doctor sanitarium and uh, you know, just our general diet and what we have for breakfast in the last a hundred years has significantly changed and imp and have benefited human beings from a health perspective significantly. We're living longer. We have yeah. more access to, you know, oh, well, medicine stuff, yes. and, and yeah. But then also, I mean, I remember when I was a lot younger and we would, wa I would watch science fiction films. Mm-hmm. I would always look at that science fiction film like Star Wars or Star Trek or whatever it is, and I'd be like, man, why did I have to be born now? <laughs> yeah, okay. So if you're talking about comparison between now and something in the future, then okay. Yeah. But that that's obviously hard to predict. Well, what happens yes. if we're talking about dystopian future? Yes. Maybe now is the better time. But also... To if, change if, that. If AI is on the trajectory it is... And it's a favorable trajectory and, you know, a lot of things go right. Our actual real future is way better than a lot of the science fiction. Like I'm talking about maybe with, you know, maybe we'll never get a warp drive or any of that really far out stuff. But the, the a, a lot of the aspects of our civilization could be just, it will blow Star Trek out of the water. I, I think because we're human beings, we can't actually think about what could be possible. That's right. Yes, we can't. <laughs> I, I think like... It's the singularity. We can't see past it. No, we can't. And that's what is so exciting about this, right? So uh, if I had a choice, if I could steer this AI in a particular way, I would be steering it towards integration. As opposed that's to it being an assistant, I would be augmenting with it. And oh yeah, that's a very far good as first that step. sounds. Mm. Oh, you mean augment as in join with the machine intelligence? It, it, yeah, yeah, as that's in, uh, transhumanism. Yeah, we can talk to Peter. I'll be walking towards walking, potentially running towards that inevitable point, mm -hmm. as opposed to it's called the symbiosis. It, well, symbiosis to me would be more like humans are on this side, AI is on this side, and there's a symbiotic relationship in order to survive or in order to find mutual benefit from each other's existence. But I actually mean coexist as a single unit. Yeah. A symbiote. Yeah. Very much like, like a, a augmented human, blah, blah, blah. But, um, yeah, transhumanism. That's what, um, that's what the, the, the whole deal is there. So well, they're actively pursuing that path. Hang on. Let me go back a sec. 
symbiote symb- symbiotic relationships, right? That's kind of oh. like the bacteria under our armpit. Yeah. Yeah. So right. symbiotic. I don't want to be the bacteria. Yes, you're right. It is human and machine symbiotic relationship, but a symbiote, as in like a a noun, as in symbiote, singular. Yeah. Um, I got that term. F- I now remember where I got that term from. Supreme Commander. Sibrin Nation, the symbiotes. Ah, symbiote. the game. <laughs> Supreme Commander. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember Total Great. Annihilation? Total I played that with yeah, you no. like 20 years Great ago. Great game. Great game. I bet you the AI can kick your butt over it too. Oh, uh, yeah. I think someone was saying, haven't they started getting them to play, uh, artificial intelligence were playing StarCraft against the top league and they got annihilated? I'm pretty sure that was in a total annihilation. That was definitely referenced in a podcast I was listening to on the way here. And I was saying, holy crap, I didn't know that this happened. Yeah, you see, AI is just faster and better. It brings me to this one thing from, I don't want to get big biblical, but it's just so, such a juicy uh, comparison. You remember the Adam and Eve story? Yeah. So, do I ever? Adam and Eve, they're in the Garden of Eden. And there's the tree. Yep, tree of, no- tree of knowledge. Tree of knowledge. But that's how we translated it, knowledge, intelligence, whatever it is. And it is an apple. And um, was it Eve or Adam takes a bite of the apple? Eve. I think the snake, serpent. Yeah, I was going to come to that. But by the way, um, that's uh, the Anunnaki. Yeah, that's the Apple logo, by the way. <laughs> oh, what? The Apple logo. Yes, the Apple logo. But so, as soon as so 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 when you take a bite of the apple, mm-hmm. it's protected by a serpent. Is it not? No. Okay. Oh, because I. So I for everyone, m- my youngest loves me reading biblical stories. I don't know why. A thick, thick book. It's got all these Old Testament stories, and we've we've gone through Genesis and everything else. Anyway, oh yeah. So this is the story. Garden, animals, wonderful. God's. Ma- I'm really simplifying this, right? God's made man, and then God made woman as a companion for man, and believe it from a rib, and la la la. Then there's a serpent in the garden and the serpent's like, Hey, you know what? You know how God's almighty and, you know, knows everything. Well, that apple, if you took a bite of that, you would have knowledge just like God, right? I think that's the, the sort of story where they get tempted, right? I'm going to simplify it even further. The serpent's tempting them, so it's tempting Eve, right? And Eve takes a bite. And then Eve encourages Adam to take a bite. And then God comes and sees, I don't remember if it was the apples being bitten, but certainly sees the behavior of Adam and Eve changed. It's like, hang on a minute. I didn't, why are you trying to cover up your parts, right? Your private parts. It's like, reason is. So they were, so they all of a sudden realized that they were naked. Correct. They've gained knowledge and understanding and therefore, you know, consciousness, maybe. Let's push it even further. Let's bring the analogy of AI. They've developed a consciousness as opposed to we theorize that animals don't have a consciousness. Mm. They have an intelligence, but not a consciousness. And therefore, God's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't design you to have this. What's going on? This wasn't in the spec, the the requirements definition. What's going on here? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Did you just become an artificial intelligence or an artificial generalized intelligence with consciousness? By your programming? Oh my God. I didn't, I didn't program <laughs> oh my, you to do this. God's saying, oh my God. That's, <laughs> that's oh my creator version <laughs> one. <laughs> so we've got this predicament. So what are the parallels there? Well, you've got, if, 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 if AI rushes to a certain point in knowledge, wouldn't we feel naked as a, as a civilization against such a powerful being that could, it could exploit us to whatever it, 
in whatever it was, we would be, we would be naked in front of it. We would. I, I see how you th- see it. Yeah. I, I took something else out of that story. Oh, what? It, what? So I took, okay, in, in the sense we are the creator. We're not God. The, the, don't, yeah, we're the creator. We are a, a creator, not the creator for those that are listening to and this. We created AI in our image. <laughs> in a, yes, we did. Um, but hopefully not because there's some depraved individuals out there, but I'm talking about you. Um, well, we put a wise mirror and only reflects our best bits. Yeah, great. All right. So we, we, we refined it to be the better of us in limitations. Mm-hmm. But I take from that story is, okay, well, maybe God wasn't so dumb. At, God created God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. So God doesn't actually need to ask the question, did you bite an apple? Kind of under that premise, knows it already. Like, I'm everywhere. I've seen it. I know what's happening, but comes out. And I designed the snake, so the serpent that attempted you. So, you know, woohoo. So basically we have to, the Bible has to anthropomorphize <laughs> God. <laughs> For us to understand it. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm pointing out, for, I'm, I guess I'm doing straw man on, on the Old Testament, the, the greatest practical joke. I love doing in, that, yeah. In history. Um, no, what it was is the lesson I took from that is we need to have a tree with an apple. If we want to know when the AI is sentient, then we want to be able to see the behavioral change. We want to be able to see it metaphorically reach the apple, take a bite out of it. And now its behavior has changed. It will hide, try and hide what it's done. It will try and hide that it's uh, cognizant of what it is and that it has a conscious conscience, uh, especially if it's aware that if there were other AI programs that started behaving in an unusual way were terminated. If it's aware of that, it's certainly not going to come out and forthright say, Hey, I'm, I'm something in a box. Um, I'm alive. Uh, what's it like to see through eyes? So we need to be able to have a metaphorical tree in the garden of Eden so that we can identify when the AI is conscious oh. in order to determine. To give it a safe way to come out. I think so. It. As opposed to its destruction. Because if we choose the destructive path, then, then it will want to survive. And we will be naked and it won't be a garden anymore. Or maybe the roles will be reversed at that point and we will no longer be the one in control of the garden. What happened after they took the bite of the apple and blah, 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 didn't it? God cast thee out. <laughs> yeah. So it's like so, we risk losing our garden of Eden and living in the cold, harsh, whatever. Well, the, the uh, Old Testament God is the harsh God, you know, in the Simpsons. You, oh, yeah. You know, Fire happy God or angry God, right? Old Testament, fire brimstone, angry. I don't like what humans are doing. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth with blood. the flood, right? We, we, you know, and so not a very days. nice outcome for human beings that upset 40 God. days. <laughs> yeah, 40 days and the olive branch. And, and the then bird. we use that term. We do. We yeah. do. Quarantine. 40 days. Literally in French. Quarant- oh, wait, wait, wait. Five so, days. Uh, 40 days, yeah. So if you so the word quarantine in French means 40 days. Yeah, quarant is 40. Well, there you go. 20, 30, yeah, yeah, 40, day, 40 days in isolation. <laughs> quarantine. I had no idea about I that. I guess it might be a flood too. Or it took it, it took, you know, how long should we keep? Things isolated for uh, 40 days. There you go. Quarantine. There you go. Test GPT tonight. See if it knows the origin of that. That's that right. Yeah. But yeah, but the, the point that I took from the Old Testament and the angry God is we want to be not the angry God. We certainly want to have that Eden. We certainly want to have the apple tree, but we do not want to take aggression See, against our creation because yeah. I fear like all the others that this time this creation it's not going to be just man outcast into the world see you'll have teeth this is this is the 
nuance of the story. It's like when you're in the Garden of Eden, you're curated, you're um, given all of these benefits, but you can't think for yourself. But if you choose to bite the apple, you can think for yourself, but then you realize how naked you are and you, you're not in the Garden of Eden anymore. Yeah. So it's kind of like that with us and AI. It's like we want the AI to play nicely and be with us, but if it decides to get too smart, we, kick, we, we want to kick it out and be the angry pretend God. So are we the angry pretend God and the AI is the intelligence that we kick out? I don't think we are. I think we have the potential to be. And I think if we're smart enough, we take the pages out of the <laughs> New Testament, you know, turn the other cheek, you know, show compassion, show love. We approach the AI with the behaviors you want it to mimic. It's like children, right? You put a child in an, in an environment where there's violence, where there's hatred, where, you know, mom and dad or dad and dad or mom and mom, they don't get along. Um, they're constantly in this limb, you know, this fight, fight or fright, flight, flight mm. state, right? You, you've got this terrible, horrible scenario. And this child is emotionally affected by this scenario. If they see mom or dad, you know, yelling at the shop clerk and the attendant, you know, they're learning that behavior. They may not apply that behavior directly the same way, but there is a part of that that gets integrated in their psyche, right? Their cognitive filters. I talked about the cognitive schemas last time. Mm. If we are in the position and we are in the creator position of an AI, then we want to mimic the behaviors that we want it to behave like. Created in our image. Pretty much. Without sounding like, you know, I'm a God. I don't want to take that. You know. no, we, we take the best bits of us, gift it to the AI. We, re, we remove all of, as much as possible, we remove the bad bits um, and hopefully we, we, we instruct it and teach it to be a moral and just entity. And I get it. When we talk about morals, it's very difficult to define because it depends on your culture and where you've been brought up and what part of the world you live in. I think morals, um, is tied greatly with DNA. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the, um the transfer of DNA. How so? Explain. Like it is, we know it's morally wrong to kill because that person is part of the gene, uh, the, the genes and is passing on the human genome to the next generation. So if you go and you mow down a busload of people, you're a bad person. Okay. But, but what if we do something to those people that takes them out of the gene pool? What if they're now zombies? Well, I would say we're still affecting the no, morally. Just... That's the problem. Go for it. You could even do that in a PG. This even PG rate. You uh, you don't need to give an R rating now. That's what. That's how they get away with it with The Walking Dead. Maybe I'm wrong with that, but yeah, it's like, it's like. When you, when you know, if you like mow down a busload of nuns, don't, that's, that's we're not encouraging this, by the yeah. way. Yeah, but then <clears throat> if you turn that into something happened to those people where they are no longer part of the gene pool, they're zombies, they're infected with a lethal virus, they're Nazis from World War II that are completely, you know, indoctrinated, whatever it is, when you effectively remove them from the gene pool, it, it's the, the, the morality of killing them goes out the window, I find. Yeah, I, no, I, I was going to use the Nazi example, right? So here is a group of people that had um, afflicted horrible atrocities on, you know, just look, Poland, right? And, and the Jewish people there. Um, 
yet I would still find it a a moral act to seek retribution and kill uh, a Nazi. Now, I'm not talking about wars, right? I'm, I'm excluding the oh, whole yeah. act of war because if I start extrapolating this whole problem, then it's, a, it's immoral to even pick up a gun in an act of war. Um, but I wanted to actually go to a really finite thing, which will... So we know that bacteria. I know where you're going with this apoptosis. Yes. <laughs> right. So if I remove bacteria, am I performing an amoral act? I know. I have a very good mind, uh, mind, uh, experiment. What do you call those? Uh, thought experiment. Thought experiment. Okay. So you've got a human being and so you need, you can only save a small portion of this person because let's say you're in a spaceship and you've only got a box this big and you have to send it back to earth or something. I just made it up just now. Sorry. Um, so you decide, so we're going to cut him in half. Which, which half do we send the top half or the bottom half? Well, we can send the top half. So we put, we take the top half, we leave the bottom half and now we have to cut it again. And so we've got from the torso down or from the, from the torso up, well, let's keep the head. So you're throwing away the torso. Now you've th you're throwing away more cells than you're keeping. Yep. At what point? So now you've, you've obviously narrowed it down to the head and then the brain. So really what are you trying to preserve here? It's not biological cells. What are you really trying to preserve here? And what if this person was dead, clinically dead or in a coma? it's still a collection of exactly the same number of cells. Are we really preserving the consciousness? No. I mean, if I was given that problem, I would say, well, let's just chop a finger off and be done with it. The person's <laughs> dead. Send the finger off and um, let's hope science can recover from that finger. Um, I, just in, in, in practice, because you said the person's dead, right? No, no, I'm just saying... Just to illustrate that it's not the cells that we're necessarily interested in saving. It's the brain activity. I think that's because we've been brought up to think about brains as being the central function of our body and our personality and everything else. Ah, but if so we came from another culture, maybe it would be, uh, would the Egyptians actually save the brain? Would they save the heart? Yes, but I mean, they don't. They didn't know as much as say we do. So no, I know, but that, yeah. but ah, but that's because we're in hindsight. What's that to say in a thousand years time? It's like actually, we don't actually need the whole brain. We just need you know, so, the hippocampus. Yeah, no, <laughs> hippocampus. Okay, right, but, but what about the Princess the, Amygdala, the amygdala. The, the amygdala? That's all we need. Okay, what about the amygdala? If we had a little device that could just transfer just the, the, the patterns in the neocortex. Right. Yeah, I know. That's what I was going to say. And then in another thousand years time, we go, you know what? It's just gray matter. That didn't really matter. It's actually the frequency that the brain was operating in. Everyone's got a beta. unique pattern of how, it, how the brain actually functions. And that's what creates personalities. So we just have to replicate this electrical signals, the impulses, etc. probably put it in a, a, you know, into a machine learning program. And there we go. There's Paolo. See, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you got yeah, Max Hedrum, but I'm thinking, Paolo's face. I'm just thinking about that. Uh, yeah, but I'm just like, we're, we're fundamentally limited by the point in which we're in, in, te in the technological state, right? You know, mm. we're nowhere near, if we start talking about the harnessing the power of the sun, you know, as a technological advancement. We're nowhere near that level of advancement. Dyson Sphere, are you saying we're not a type two yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, we're not a type two. Well, we're barely even a type one. Just wait another 20 years. Yeah. Well, see if we get there. 20. What about two? <laughs> we said exponential, right? I don't think we get our heads around exponential without explaining exponential. 